We are um, in John's Gospel today. In fact, we're going to look at a bit of a bit of a chunk. Um, and so I encourage you to open your Bibles or apps, whatever version of Bible you carry, uh, to John chapter 18, verses 28. Um, we're going to wander through a pretty big chunk through to chapter 19, verse 16. So hold tight. Let me read it. <clears throat> Jesus before Pilate. <clears throat> then they led Jesus to the house of, from the house of Caiaphas, the governor's headquarters, to the governor's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to them, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show <clears throat> by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king, and for this purpose I was born. And for this purpose I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? After this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a, but you have a custom that I should release one man to you for the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. Still going into <clears throat> chapter 19. Apologies for my voice, by the way. I am just uh, battling a bit of a virus, but all good. Um, then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns, and they put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to him, behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw this, they cried, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to him, take him away yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. Jesus answered him, we have law and according to the law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered the headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he, delivered, he who delivered me over to you has the greatest sin. Almost wrapped up. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you're no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat, the place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now, it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, crucify him. Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. So they delivered him over to be crucified. Let's pray. Father God, we just ask that as we look into your word, that by your spirit you would reveal Jesus to us afresh, that we would hear your spirit speaking to us and glorifying and lifting up Jesus and calling us uh, to love and serve him more. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Awesome. Hey, so we're in this series uh, called When I Met Jesus. Uh, I'm not sure if you've been tracking. So our first couple of weeks, is this, am I still on? Yep. Um, we looked at when, uh, when a demon, a, a father with a demon-possessed son met Jesus. Uh, last week we looked at when the religious leaders met Jesus. Today I want to look at uh, when Pontius Pilate met Jesus. Um, I don't know about your first impressions of Pontius Pilate. I remember um, I didn't grow up in a, in a church going home, didn't grow up as a Christian, uh, but I remember my year two teacher was kind of committed in a public school to using Easter and Christmas uh, to tell us the Jesus story. You could do that back then. And um, I remember year two, I remember just Pontius Pilate, the, the scene of him washing his hands, it's not in this gospel, but I think it's in Matthew, uh, Matthew's gospel, um, Pilate washing his hands and, and as we see in this gospel, kind of trying to get Jesus off the hook is sort of how I saw it. I thought, man, this Pontius Pilate guy, he was a good, good guy, is what I thought. Um, I actually have a lot about, um, both in the Bible and external to the Bible, about Pontius Pilate uh, and history actually tells a bit of a different story that Pontius Pilate was uh, anything but a decent guy. Um, and so as we kind of look at this, uh, this Pontius Pilate, kind of look at who he was to begin with, um, and we remember as we come to the Gospels that we are not just uh, investigating stories, um, but these are events that happen. Pontius Pilate was a real historical figure, and there is a lot of both biblical and extra-biblical evidence um, and stories about him. And so uh, let's just have a look at who Pontius Pilate was, um, and then we're going to look at his encounter with Jesus. First thing about Pontius Pilate was that he was a, he was a prefect or a, a Roman governor, most likely a soldier. Uh, he'd been put in charge of the, the province of Judea. This is where the Jews lived uh, in the Roman, as Roman kind of ruled the empire, they would just put um, people in charge and then um, kind of keep peace in those areas. Um, Pilate's duties would have been firstly militarily, he would have um, <clears throat> been in charge of troops in the area, but it was more of like a police military force, um, ideally, in that area. Uh, as the governor, he was head of the judicial system, he had the power to inflict capital punishment, um, was responsible for collecting taxes and tributes for Caesar, distributing funds, even minting coins. We actually have coins from the e era of um, Pontius Pilate um, that archaeologists have found. It's pretty cool. Um, also, as governor, he had the right to appoint the Jewish high priest. Um, being prefect of Judea for the Romans is kind of like was pretty a, a kind of minor, not quite so desirable post. Um, ideally, and this is how one historian kind of uh, explains it, it's probably likely that Pilate was sort of kind of doing the dirty work, hoping to kind of ascend uh, in prominence. You know, if he kind of does Caesar a solid and does a good job in this sort of uh, less desirable kind of post uh, as Roman governor that Caesar would promote him. He was looking to kind of climb the ranks, essentially. Um, the relationship between the Jewish people, the Romans, um, particularly the officials that came before Pilate, uh, were pretty volatile, pretty hostile. Roman people thought that Jewish people were bizarre. Things like circumcision, they were like, what on earth are these people all about? Um, the general attitude towards the Jewish people from the Romans was quite derogatory. Um, and Pilate's own actions that we have seen in history kind of, um, also including in the Gospels, but kind of show that he doesn't really value these people or their customs or beliefs very well at all. In fact, the feeling was quite mutual. The Jews didn't particularly appreciate him either. Philo, the first century uh, historian, was born about AD 25. Um, he writes, this is his kind of um, summary of Pon um, Pontius Pilate, his character. So that he was naturally inflexible. He was uh, a blend of self-willed and relentlessness. He was given to bribes, insults and robberies, um, executions without trial. He described his behaviour as harsh, cruel and unwilling to compromise. Very different to the year two kind of picture that I'd picked up uh, as a kid. Uh, I miss this animosity. Uh, it's Pilate's job to kind of keep this Middle Eastern kind of um, peninsula in some sort of state of peace. Rome was dependent on... Um, on supplies and like grain and um, corn from Egypt. And so he kind of needed to keep peace in this space where there could quite easily become unrest. Uh, and he's got to keep Caesar happy. 
Uh, he's got to kind of keep a lid on things, even though he, these people don't really like him. He doesn't really like them. They're not happy about being under Roman rule. Um, historian and Bible scholar, N.T. Wright, um, says this that about Pontius Pilate, that through history, he seems to have taken some delight in making it clear to his Jewish leaders that he was the one in charge. He took delight in snubbing their requests if they wanted something. And if they, if they didn't want something, he just might go and establish, uh, go and do it anyway, just to let them know who's actually in charge of this space. Um, in his first year of office, just, a, just an example of uh, his attempts to kind of establish his rule. His first year in office, um, Pontius Pilate actually marched in uh, these... Um, <clears throat> These symbols of, uh, of Caesar, they were, had never been done before in, in Judea at that time and into Jerusalem and it brings in these kind of um, you know, um, military kind of posts but to the Jews was seen as Caesar was you know, worshipped as a god and this is bringing a false god, false religion into, his, uh, into their land. Um, when the Jews kind of got unhappy with that, they, they went and they circled his house for about five days and kind of really kind of created a bit of a, you know, confrontation. Um, Pilate's way to deal with that was to surround them with soldiers, kind of say he's going to meet and chat with them, get them surrounded with soldiers and then um, threaten them with death, hoping that he could kind of establish his rule. What he wasn't expecting was the Jewish people, because of their worship, their commitment to God, uh, bent down and exposed their necks, saying that they are willing to die um, for the honour of their God. Um, and so Pilate didn't quite know what to do with these people. He had to keep them at peace. They weren't really respecting his authority, and so he had to learn how to work with them. But he was quite a heavy-handed leader. In fact, um, Jesus is in, in the Gospel of Luke, we see that um, some of Jesus' followers come to him and they talk about this idea that Pilate had actually um, mixed the blood of some Galileans who had gone up to the temple to worship with the offering. Uh, they, that Pilate had kind of had them slaughtered in the temple courtyards is kind of uh, how this you know, decent guy um, worked amongst these people. Eventually, um, this is post-Jesus, Pilate would, um, he would confront, there was a Samaritan group in uh, AD 36 who were uh, on like a religious pilgrimage to their mountain in Samaria um, for some kind of worship and uh, Pilate actually had them all slaughtered and that eventually ended up getting a complaint back to Rome. Pilate lost his place. His attempts to climb the ladder were all over and done with. So he, history shows that Pilate wasn't a particularly nice guy um, He's cruel, he's self-serving and opportunistic. I think in order to gain further promotions, he was trying to please Caesar and that he would try to keep the peace amongst the Jewish people, although he had little respect for them. Everything he was doing was self-serving. Um, of his own ambition to kind of climb the ladder is, I think, a fair way to see, see uh, Pilate. And um, that's kind of the background that we should have when we're looking at these interactions with the Jewish people. Uh, he's not a nice guy just trying to sort of work out justice. He's a guy who has got his own agenda driven um, by his own ambitions is, is really what happens. And essentially, he's, uh, he's trying to play the game for the best outcome for himself. So let's go back to John's Gospel. <clears throat> It starts off by saying, they led Jesus to the house of Caiaphas <coughs> and to the, from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early in the morning and they themselves did not enter the governor's house so they would be defiled that they couldn't eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them. You know, last week we looked at and um, the religious leaders and Jesus. And um, it's interesting that, I guess, just to begin with, or those about Pilate, the hypocrisy of these religious leaders that uh, in their, in their um, law, for them to go into a Gentile's house would have made them ceremonially unclean and so they wouldn't be able to participate in the Passover. Um, and it's just interesting and, and John is kind of making this, uh, this irony of this situation that uh, these religious leaders were so devout um, Pick and choose, essentially, when they were devout. They were so devout that they wouldn't enter into Pilate's uh, house because they'd want to participate in Passover. But in reality, that right in front of them was Jesus, the 
the actual Passover lamb, that the, the, the God who they're trying to honour and serve by not going to Pilate's house so they can participate in the Passover, that that God was actually standing right before them who they're looking to hand over, that they, their commitment to their own uh, self-righteousness or their own rules made them completely blind to the God who was actually in their midst. Um, that's why you know, John sort of says uh, at the start of his gospel that he came, that Jesus came to his own, but his own did not recognise him. And that though their uh, mouths honoured God, that their hearts were so far from him. Um, <clears throat> the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders show that in our sinful nature, in our sinful state, it's possible that we can tick all the external boxes of of you know, religious duty and practice, but our hearts can actually be so far from God. In fact, in this scene, their hearts are actually at odds with God and enemies of God. Um, and so they are, um, you know, they also neglect the fact that they had an overnight trial that was illegal as well. So they're picking and choosing kind of where they want to rule in terms of what helps uh, them and their cause. Back to... Uh, this is verse 29. So Pilate went outside because they wouldn't come inside. In fact, when we go through this narrative, you see Pilate is going in and out and in and out constantly. It's almost, if you had like Benny Hill music behind it, it's almost humorous that he keeps having to walk inside to talk to Jesus and back outside to talk to um, the Pharisees. But uh, Pilate went outside to talk to them. What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, take them to yourselves and judge them by your own law. The Jews said to him, it's not lawful for us to put him to death. This was to fill the word that Jesus had spoken to show the type of death he was going to die. Legally, because the Jews were under Roman rule, they couldn't um, carry out the death penalty, even though their law at times said someone should be stoned to death. Um, it's interesting, again, that the, the religious leaders pick and choose when they do this. We see in Acts later on that they actually stone Stephen to death. Um, but what they ultimately wanted, their agenda, um, they wanted Jesus to be put to death by crucifixion. Crucifixion uh, of Jesus to them would be showing Jesus' followers and anyone who would thought that he was the Messiah that he was actually cursed by God, as their law said in uh, Deuteronomy 21. It's interesting that, um, you know, the Bible says that uh, even though they are trying to put Jesus to death and they really are trying to orchestrate this so Jesus could be crucified, um, it, makes, it, it tells us that Jesus actually prophesied this. And the, the overarching narrative of this story is we see that um, both with Pilate and the religious leaders, and we'll get to Pilate a bit more soon, um, despite their evil intentions, their rejection, the rebellion against God, that God is sovereign is actually outworking his own plan through this whole situation. Though, though it seems like evil might be in charge, um, in, in John chapter 12, Jesus already prophesied that he would be crucified. In fact, we see that even in the Old Testament, like uh, places like Psalm 22, where it's always God's plan that he was going to work out um, his plan of salvation through the crucifixion of the Messiah. Um, <clears throat> then keep going on. So Pilate entered the headquarters and again, so he's gone back inside, said to Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And here's where the challenge is for Pilate. Um, his ambition is to, to, keep, um, to keep Judea at peace. His ambition is to make sure he plays the game, keeps Caesar happy, um, keeps the Jewish people kind of not kind of throwing a revolt. Um, that way he can kind of self-serve and hopefully get himself out of Judea and onto a better promotion with more money. Um, but the thought that Jesus could be a king for him, that means there's a potential uprising at hand. And so he comes, he questions Jesus, wanting to know if he is a king. Um, his ideal is, is to keep peace. And so we see, and we see over and over again, Pilate's heart towards Jesus, uh, the challenge I think, and I think I find personally, is, is really where does Jesus fit in terms of the goals I want to pursue in my life? He's, if, if Jesus is a king and these Jewish people don't like him and there's got to be an uprising, uh, what, do I, what do I do with Jesus to make sure he kind of gets out of the way of my plans. If Jesus is a king and he's going to cause an uprising, that could 
uh, be trouble for me if Jesus uh, is it a king and I let him go and the Jewish people cause an uprising because they're not happy with me. That's going to be an issue with me. And so Pilate, I think, is always behind the scenes of this being self-serving, trying to work out how it works for him. Jesus answered, to, answered him, do you say this on your own accord or did others say this about me? Coming down, a little few verses down, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting and might not have been delivered to Jews, but my kingdom is not from this world. Here's the idea. We're seeing this clash of kingdoms in this narrative. Um, Jesus saying that his kingdom is not of this world is not saying that his kingdom is some far-off spiritual kind of future uh, thing. Jesus' whole life, ministry, mission was announcing that the kingdom of of God was coming now. The kingdom of God was present, that his, his work and his words um, were saying the rule of God is coming now in and through him, in and through his work and his mission. Um, and so he's saying to, to Pilate, yeah, I am a king and I do have a kingdom, but it's different and is not of this world. Hence, this is not a kingdom that's going to be established um, by violence. This is not a kingdom that's going to be established by overthrowing anyone uh, in the way that Pilate maybe thinks Jesus is coming. However, um, Jesus' kingdom is a kingdom that uh, is in the world, but not of the world, is Jesus' kingdom. And so Pilate says, so you are a king. Jesus says, you, you have say that I am a king, and for this purpose I was born. For this purpose I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? Here's another one of these ironies. We saw with the, the Jewish people, they wanted to participate in Passover, but they were blind to see that the true Passover was happening right in front of them. They rejected Jesus, who was standing in front of them, the true Passover lamb, um, because of their own agenda and their own thoughts and their own um, blindness and sin. And now we see again with um, Pilate, he asks this question, what is truth? And, and the irony that John is wanting us to see is even a few chapters before, Jesus had declared himself as the way, the truth, and the life. Um, Jesus was present right there in front of him. And I would suggest um, that, that Pilate himself is blinded to the reality of Jesus in a, in a similar but different way to what the, the Jewish leaders were. Um, Pilate had a pursuit, a pursuit of his own way and truth and life. Um, For Pilate, his way and truth of life was through what the world could offer. He was committed to to pursuing power, um, position, and so that was his way and his truth. Um, He can only see this, this, uh, what Jesus is saying through a worldly perspective, and so he says, what is truth? Even though truth, the person is standing right in front of him. Uh, One of the commentators notes, As far as he knows, the only place, this is for Pilate, you can get truth is from the sheath of a sword. Political truth is my truth versus your truth, my sword versus your sword. Pilate is committed to a different way and truth and life. Uh, The way of the world, he is in pursuit of power or pleasure, popularity, possessions. Everything the world offers, Pilate is trying to work, (coughs) is trying to work towards and so Jesus really for him just becomes, okay, are you in the way or are you going to help me get what I'm pursuing? Are you in the way of, of me pursuing power and promotion and, and the pleasures of the world or are you going to help me? That's, I think that's what he's trying to work out, what to do with Jesus based on that. Um, and his pride also means he's got to maintain kind of giving the Jewish leaders a hard time, making sure he keeps his authority on them. On top of this, it's not in this gospel, but I guess he's, he's balancing this idea of you know, wanting to keep Caesar happy um, for his own benefit, wanting to keep the Jewish people um, happy for his own benefit. In the other gospels, we also hear that his wife sent him a message um, saying, have nothing to do with Jesus. And so you can imagine that whirlwind because now he's got to try and keep his the wife's not going to be happy either. I'm not sure who he feared more as the wife or Caesar. Um, but what a, this whirlwind and um, Pontius Pilate essentially being self-serving is really, I I think, trying to work out this system for how it best suits him. 
Jesus says, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. You know, if, I think if Pilate was, was genuinely a, a pursuer of truth, genuinely wanting to understand the reality of who Jesus is, wanting to understand the reality of uh, the Jewish um, scriptures and understanding, then he might have recognised that it was actually the king of kings standing in front of him. He might have recognised that he was in the presence of the person who is truth. Maybe his, his pursuit, essentially, of his own selfish gain and ambition blinded him to the reality of the truth. I don't know about you, but um, my journey... Um, give me have some water one second. I've certainly seen... Um, I've certainly seen how many people in pursuit of what the world has will reject Jesus as Lord. Not because they're pursuing to understand truth but because really he doesn't fit in with what they're pursuing. As I said, I didn't grow up in a Christian home and um, had, a, <clears throat> had a best friend. I used to play basketball with him and um, we were kind of headed on the same path when I became a follower of Jesus around 10th grade. And, um, and he found out about it. <clears throat> My friend found out about um, that I became a follower of Jesus. The very next morning he meets me as I rock up to school and he's like, man, I heard you're a Jesus follower now. And his first question was, does that mean you're not going to get drunk at parties and, and sleep around? Um, he recognised that pursuing Jesus was, was saying no to that. Um, and we kind of headed off. We stayed friends, but in these different um, directions. Um, I went kind of as hard as I could following Jesus, and he threw himself into that lifestyle. Um, very sadly, he became an alcoholic, um, broken marriages, all sorts of things. And, and I actually buried him last year. Uh, as, a, as an alcoholic, he, he ruined his life and his liver, that his pursuit, um, rather than, and I caught up there many times and shared Jesus with him, but his pursuit of pleasure and whatever the world had to offer, mate, he was blind, blinded to the reality of Jesus as the truth, um, who could really fulfill him and devastating to his, to his furthest, I guess, concept, um, Similarly, I guess I've seen so many of my friends, it is really hard, caught up with one of them just recently. Um, I've seen them walk away from Jesus, not because they have um, diligently pursued truth, um, but because their hearts pursued something else of this world. Pleasure, possessions, popularity. Um, when the way of Jesus essentially failed to help or to provide um, a, a way to what they, their real God was, <clears throat> whatever that was, um, they let go of Jesus and the reality is and the challenge of Jesus is often that his way, um, often he'll even ask us to give away or forego the pursuit of worldly pleasure, power, possessions, popularity. There are um, places for that under him in, in his purity and within, under his word, but the idea that Jesus calls us to seek first his kingdom, that he is the king of kings and that he is uh, one of truth. And I guess I again have, like, have to acknowledge in my own heart um, I know within myself I can both overlook or miss Jesus by going through like the, the Pharisees, just the, the ins and outs and the kind of, um, you know, <clears throat> the rhythms or the external kind of, you know, go to church, read your Bible, but actually not connect with Jesus. But similarly to, to Pilate, the amount of times in my life where um, somewhere, somehow, some pursuit of, of something just kind of takes my heart off in a different direction and I, and I lose touch with or come out of submission to um, Jesus. I wonder how, how are you in those spaces? Who do you relate to or connect to? Where do you uh, find yourself in pursuit? That We see here in this, this narrative that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life, but uh, someone who completely misses that because I've bought into the world's lie that there is a different way, a different truth, a different life, and they miss uh, the true joy, Pilate. Misses the true joy of what it would be to acknowledge Jesus as the King. <clears throat> um, and so we just moving through, and not, not too much more to go, but um, in chapter 9 we see that Jesus, uh, is, like Pilate orders Jesus to be flogged and humiliated. Soldiers put the crown on his head, uh, thorns. <clears throat> Um, over and over again in this narrative, Pilate asserts over and over again that Jesus is innocent. And that's really important. Uh, over and over again, that there is no fault in him, um, that there is no reason for Jesus to be put to death um, that would be 
of his own sinfulness, that Jesus is the, the pure and spotless lamb to be slain for our sins. Um, and over and over again, Pilate recognises this. So within himself, he even knows. He has no uh, legal reason, no good reason to put Jesus to death. Uh, anyway, he has him flogged, brings him out, says he has found no guilt in him. The Jews answer him, we have a law, and according to the law, he ought to die because he's made himself the son of God. And when Pilate heard this, he became even more afraid. That's interesting because for the Jewish people, um, the fact that Jesus would call himself the son of God is blasphemy uh, within their worldview, that he is a, um, <clears throat> a man claiming to be like God. And that's blasphemy, and therefore they must put him to death. It says that Pilate was afraid of that statement, but it's not because he fears the Jewish God. Within his worldview, his understanding, um, Caesar was referred to as the son of God. And so all of a sudden, I think Pilate is intimidated once again. If this Jesus is walking around and saying that he is the son of God, he's actually challenging Caesar. And again, if Pilate uh, wants to kind of keep Caesar happy, he cannot let this man go. And so he continues to kind of uh, interview him and work out what is he going to do with Jesus. Coming down, once again, he has these conversations. He's in and he's out and he's uh, back inside chatting with Jesus. Pilate says, you, uh, you know, that he has the authority to crucify him. Why, why will you not answer me, Jesus? Just give me a straight answer. Jesus sort of seems to always be not giving these straight answers or Pilate doesn't really understand his answers because he's coming at it from a different space. And Jesus says this, and it's really uh, important in this kind of um, interaction of Pilate and Jesus. Jesus says, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Jesus communicates to Pilate, who is actually running the universe. Pilate, uh, has, he, he thinks his governing authority or his authority over Jesus comes under the fact that he is under Caesar and therefore has this, this power that he believes comes from Caesar. But Jesus is actually saying, no, no, there's actually a God over the universe, and if he had not given you authority, you would have no authority over me. The pilot thinks his delegated um, power is what's giving him power over Jesus, but is actually, Jesus acknowledges that there is a God who's in charge of the universe. Um, that we see in here, this is a clash of two kingdoms. It's a clash of the kingdom of Rome and the clash of the kingdom of God. Um, the kingdom of earth um, these kingdoms, these powers, the politics, uh, they do not have authority over God. There's God who's actually working out and does work out and will work out his plan um, through this whole process. It's kind of the, um, <clears throat> the amazing picture that we see as we kind of oversee that there's this there's sin and there's these two different groups. We've got the, the Jewish people and the Roman governor both uh, set with our hearts against Jesus, against ultimately the, the will of God, um, in their sin, doing everything they can to, to squash or to put down uh, what they think is, is um, Jesus and who they think um, is, you know, is crazy or, or misleading them. Um, but in this, we see working through this is the creator, that God is working through ultimately his plan of history, the sovereignty of God. That political powers, uh, religious powers, whoever's voted in, voted out, actually cannot stop the will of God. It doesn't mean that um, what they're doing is good, even though God is using it for good. Jesus acknowledges, he said, those who hand you over have done the greatest sin. You know, when we look out into the world and we wonder, uh, even right now, there's, there's things going on. And, and for us, uh, we may think, um, where is all this going? Uh, evil seems to be in some spaces having, uh, having their reign and the fact that God is still over and in charge and is still will and does work out his plan in history and nothing, no power uh, of any kind of authority can actually stop that, that God is the ultimate authority is what Jesus is saying and so we can have peace. It doesn't mean that just because God uses it is not sin or not evil. Um, think of the, the things going on in the Middle East right now that... Um, I've probably spent way too much time looking at this week, to be honest. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. 
and and for a lot of people, um, it's it's hopeless. I know some people, um, you know, even with certain um, political spaces, we see when when certain parties get voted in, um, they think the world's going to come to an end, or it's all over now because they think that. These political powers are the ones who are ultimately running the universe, but we have a peace, and Jesus shows that uh, it's actually God who is in control, and we can trust in him. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice. I think... Um, the vision that God gives Isaiah in, in Isaiah 6 verse 1 is really helpful um, for this picture. Um, in Isaiah 6 verse 1 says, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. The training of his robe filled the temple. Uh, this vision that, um, that God gives King Isaiah. King Isaiah was one of the goodish kings of Israel. They didn't have too many great kings, but King Isaiah was one of the okay ones. He'd ruled for a long time. And there was an uncertainty or an unsettling when he passed away because there's, okay, who's, who's in charge now? And the vision that God actually gives um, the prophet Isaiah is, is God himself on the throne, the God himself in control, and that's where we should find our peace. And so in this clash um, we see between these two kingdoms, we have um, a man <clears throat> who thinks he's in power a man who thinks he's in charge, um, a man whose heart is very much set for personal gain. And he comes into into action with Jesus. And I I guess the challenge um, that I find personally from this, as I said, as a a man who is um, so caught up in the ways or the pleasures or the power or um, what that world can offer him, that he completely misses Jesus. And I have to recognise within myself um, my own challenges of that, my own um, proclivities towards completely disconnecting from God, um, pursuing other things, even the, like you know good things, not horrible things, but not recognising that it is actually the King of Kings who is present, available with us. Jesus was right in front of Pilate and right in front of the religious leaders, present and available but they miss him. And uh, I just wonder for, for yourselves and for myself, uh, how, how are we doing that in our own lives? Is that a, is that a reality for us, that, that we would miss Jesus because we're in pursuit of other things, that we'd miss uh, his goodness in our lives, we'd miss his leading in our lives because of the pursuit of other things? Luckily, when we come to this, Jesus eventually ends up being crucified and killed. And it looks like the powers of the religious, you know, the religious uh, elite and Rome have, have put him down. Um, but we, we know that's not the end of the story, that Christ is resurrected uh, and is victorious ultimately over this sin, over all sin. And the encouragement to me is that when Jesus is, is being crucified, that even then he prays for those who are responsible directly for his crucifixion. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. That with Jesus, that uh, even if we would wrestle with, with, like the religious leaders, getting caught up in self-righteousness and kind of missing the point, or that we would get caught up in the world, that's even those sins that Jesus is dying for and rising for, is those sins that Jesus is offering forgiveness for and inviting us to come into his kingdom. When Jesus um, predicted his death in John 12, that, that this kind of passage alludes to, this is what Jesus actually said. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men to myself. He said this to show the way that he was going to die. That the judgment of these empires, the judgment of sin, the judgment of everything that would come against Jesus, even the the kingdoms of this world, uh, was going to come upon Jesus when he is lifted up. The crazy thing is, is that the language that Jesus uses being lifted up, he refers to it as crucifixion, but it's actually also the same language that you'd use of a king ascending his throne. And so Jesus, uh, in this this amazing act of sacrifice is inaugurating the kingdom. 
He's taking up his place on the throne as he's taking judgment uh, over sin. And therefore, it's, it's through the cross and um, the resurrection of Jesus through his blood shed. Not only that, our sins are forgiven, but we are invited and brought into being citizens of this kingdom that is now present. Present now and present uh, in its fullness in the future, but it is definitely present now. And so the invitation is we, uh, we're about to come around the Lord's table. Um, I want to encourage you to once again take, uh, take the elements, not as a, uh, I guess, an empty ritual, not as, a, um, <clears throat> not as a kind of obligation, but in them connect with Jesus in the elements as we take communion, uh, that we would recognise and look to the presence of Jesus who is with us to forgive us. And as we do so, I'd ask you and encourage you to um, ask the Spirit of God to show you where it is that you may be pursuing other things and missing him and his goodness. Uh, I think the, the, the challenge I know in my own life of, of the ways of the world is that it promises the very things that the kingdom of God can only actually fulfill. That it's Jesus who can give us peace. It's Jesus who can give us fullness. It's Jesus who can fill our hearts with love. It's Jesus who can um, <clears throat> bring restoration to families. I would encourage you once again to submit your hearts to King Jesus as King knowing that he will bring and give life, that we wouldn't be like Pilate who, who misses out on the very presence of truth with us, that Jesus is with us now. Isaiah 53 says that we are all like sheep have gone astray. We've all kind of gone in the direction of one or the other, or if you're like me, both of, of this kind of empty self-righteousness uh, or just, just pursuing worldly things and not pursuing Jesus. We've all gone astray but the Lord has laid on him, that's Jesus, the iniquity of our soul. Whatever it is that we would feel that the Spirit would guide us into conviction over, know for certain that Jesus has paid the price for it. That Jesus would even offer forgiveness to someone like Pontius Pilate had he been willing to turn and, and accept it. That Jesus offered that forgiveness to those religious people, all those who put him to death. All sin can be forgiven in him. And all can become new citizens of the kingdom of heaven. As you choose to trust in Jesus, I just encourage you to see afresh. He is the king who sits above every kingdom. Whatever concerns you have, with the things going on in the world, know that our king and our God who loves us and knows us is in charge and he is working out his plan. Regardless of how sinful or powerful uh, people may seem, God's authority is the greatest authority. In the first week we looked at how there are demons and other spiritual things, but Jesus' authority is the highest authority over the, those in the spiritual realm. And we have to recognise that Jesus' authority is the highest authority over every king, every kingdom, every uh, politician, every boss, that Jesus is actually the king of all kings and we can live out a life as citizens of that kingdom that's present now. We choose to trust the crucified and resurrected one. We live by the power of the Spirit. That we are beloved and adopted children of God. That we live out a life of announcing that Jesus is the true King. We live a life of prayer and love and service in His name to see His kingdom come on earth as in heaven. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we look to you and we acknowledge that like Pilate and the religious leaders that we shrink you down at times. We want to put you in a box so we can use you for our own pursuits or we overlook your goodness because we think there's something better in the world. Jesus, we thank you that your kingdom uh, 
is the true kingdom. We thank you that you're a forgiving king, that Jesus, you died for the sins of us rejecting you over and over again. And so I thank you, Lord, that we can be new again in you, fully forgiven and fully free. Holy Spirit, I ask you, fill us afresh as we take the emblems, as we take the bread and the wine today. Holy Spirit, that you would empower us once again to live as citizens of this kingdom that is here now under our King Jesus, knowing that he is the power and authority above all powers and authority. In Jesus' name, amen.